Good morning, one and all. It's so good to see y'all. I'm excited to be here with each one of you. And uh, Barbara, that was beautiful. Yes. You know, I think my mother had you in mind when she made me go to piano lessons for five or six years. But it sure didn't come out like that. That's a wonderful gift you had. I'm, I'm so glad you shared it with us this morning. Well, we're in the book of Colossians, uh, chapter 2. We start this morning at verse 16. And I would like to read for you the last verse that we ended up on last week because it sort of sets the stage for this week. Uh, let me read to you uh, verse 15. It's talking about Jesus, and it says, Having spoiled principalities and powers, having spoiled, defeated, vanquished, the principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And that's where we left off, and where we pick up this morning, Paul says this in verse 16 of chapter 2. Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. If I was writing this to a, a church in Colossae, a church that most scholars believe he never, never went there. He didn't uh, have a personal experience with these people. Uh, Epaphroditus was a man that started the church, and he was a friend of Paul, and had come to visit Paul in Rome while he was in prison. And uh, shared with them the needs of what was going on in the church over there in Colossae. And as it turned out, they had two problems. They had a, they had a group of uh, Christians who were formerly Jews, who still believed in some of the Jewish regulations. You had to be circumcised. You had to keep the Old Testament food laws and such as that. And then they had another group of false teachers in that church, and they were they were what came to be known as Gnostics. Gnostics. These were people that believed that they were super Christians, that they had secret revelations and dreams and visions, and it was only for the select few. It wasn't for everybody. And so they felt that they were superior to everybody. And Paul's written this little book that we're studying here to counter the teachings of those two groups, the, the Judaizers, the legalists, and the uh, Gnostics. And as he said, when I read verse 15 there for you, he said, because Christ has defeated all the principalities and powers, and he's openly triumphed over them, he has made a display of them as their, uh, as their conqueror, if you will, don't listen to people that come into your church and try to put legalistic ideas into your heads about what you should eat or drink or what day you should worship on or such as that. Now, I could tell when I read that, uh, some of you have already tuned me out this morning. And the reason is, is because you're thinking, you're thinking, well, I don't have anybody telling me uh, not to eat pork or shrimp. Uh, I don't really have anybody bothering me about worshiping on Sunday. Uh, these people did, but I don't. Well, that's true. But to be quite honest with you, the, the teaching that comes out of this passage, if we honestly look at what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, it's present in our church, at every church, at every church that's ever been and every church that ever will be, and that is the tendency of people in their flesh to fall back into legalism, ritualism. And uh, it's something we'll never get away from. It's something that's always gonna be a part of us. And so Paul says, look at him. He says, therefore, well, what's the therefore for? It's because of verse 15, because Christ on the cross has defeated all these principalities and powers, all these rules, all these uh, legalistic ideas. He's annulled 
the Old Testament uh, rules about diet and ceremony and such as that. Uh, don't let anybody judge you. Don't let anybody come to you and tell you that you're not uh, walking correctly with God because of what you eat or what you drink or uh, because of what holidays that you support or what, uh, what day you worship God on. Don't let it happen. The implication is, friends, is it does happen. And that's why we've got this teaching from Paul this morning. The idea is that Christ is everything. Amen. That knowing him, walking in his spirit, being led by the spirit of God, Christ alone, you're complete. Amen. That's the whole message of Colossians. It's, uh, it's hard for some people to accept that. You know why? Because they want to work about it. They want to work for Jesus in a way that makes Jesus love them more. They think there's a tendency for them, for some people in their flesh, to think that that God would love me more if I fell in the blank, if I uh, if I eat a certain way, if I fast, if I go to church every time the doors open, if I uh, if I follow those 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 Jewish food laws, maybe. And what about if I what if I observe those Jewish feasts? Wouldn't God be pleased with me? Legalism or ritualism, whatever terms you're more comfortable with, is what this passage is about. And I want to say to you, it's all it's all wrong, and it all falls short of knowing Christ. Uh, think about it like this. Uh, think about your relationship with perhaps your mother or your father. Think about maybe your relationship with your wife or your husband. And there you are on the couch some evening, the two of you together, and you decide that you want that special person to know that you love them. And so you go in the kitchen and you prepare all these special foods and bring them out and, and eat them in front of them. Or you decide that a certain day of the week is when you're gonna, you're gonna uh, devote yourself to a special day of the week. Maybe the Sabbath. It's, it's, the, it's the nature of our flesh to think that we can act or we can perform in such a way that makes God love us more. Yes. And it's got to be so sad on God's side of the relationship to see his children thinking they've got to do little tricks. They've got to act in a certain way in his presence. That they, they feel like that he doesn't love them enough so much so that they've got to act out in front of him with whatever legalistic uh, topic or manner of acting they can come up with. And believe me, there's lots of them. When you, when you see a group of ladies out and about during the week and you can tell by their dress what denomination they belong to, that's legalism. It's saying that God wants me to act this way or look this way or be this way or talk this way in order for him to accept me. And what Paul is teaching us here in this passage is the fact that, friends, you've got to pay attention to the fact that Christ has openly defeated all the principalities, the elemental spirits of this world. That's all gone. Now it's you and Christ. And Christ is everything. He's everything that you need. Pascal wrote, Jesus Christ is the center of everything. He's the object of everything. And he who does not know him knows nothing of the order of the world and nothing of himself. Well, I agree with him. 
these people were struggling to figure out a way to live as Christian people. They were believers, but they were trying to, to perhaps put God in such a box that they had to act or look or be in a certain way before God would love them. And if that's the way you're living in legalism like that, you don't understand the love of God. Everything that looks spiritual is not. Have you ever heard the expression of a red herring? A red herring? I've heard it about much in my life, but I didn't ever know what it meant until I looked it up. And it's interesting. In England, when they would train uh, dogs to hunt the fox, in training them, they'd want them to keep their nose on the trail, the scent of the fox as they ran through the forest. And to be sure that they were very well trained, at times they would get a, a herring, a fish, a dead fish, and they would drag it across the trail. And at first the dogs, when they're chasing the fox, would smell that old fish, and they'd get distracted and get off the trail. But in time, with proper training, they would learn to ignore the red herring and keep chasing that old fox. Well, what Paul's teaching us here in this verse is just that. That any time, as Christians now, now, I'm not saying this to everybody, I'm saying this to Christian people. Any time we think that our performance changes the behavior or attitude of God towards us, we are missing the mark. We're sadly mistaken. It's just in us. Our flesh wants to perform. Our flesh even wants to be religious. But in Christ, you've been made complete. You are accepted in Christ. He is everything that you need. Verse 17, it goes on. Now, you remember what he's talking about. He's talking about legalism, rituals. Old Testament practices or anything that you conceive in your mind that you think you have to do in order for God to love you. These things are a shadow of things to come, he says. But the substance belongs to Christ. So what, in this case, he's talking about the Old Testament. All those uh, ceremonial laws, dietary laws, Sabbaths, new moons, festivals, Feast, all that. He said that's just a, that was just a shadow. But the substance is now come and it belongs to Christ. What you eat doesn't matter to God. Now I know there's some people here that are very health conscious. And they want to chastise me right now for saying such a thing. And I deserve it because, you know, there are some foods that are more healthy than others. I, I accept that. But as far as your relationship with God goes, food is neutral. Yes. Now that Christ has come. Let me read for you what Jesus said about food. Mark 7. There's nothing outside of man which going into him can defile him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. For from within, and out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, <coughs> deeds of coveting, wickedness, deceit, Lord, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things proceed from within and defile the man. So the point that Jesus is making to us is that I'm here and I'm the substance of everything that men have aspired to and longed for and, and wished for to know how can I be saved? How can I be accepted of God? When can I stop doing this dance of religion and know that he loves me and he'll never, he'll never turn from me, he'll never leave me? Well, that's what Jesus is teaching here. It's not because of the food you eat. It's not because of the festivals you keep. It's, the, it's not because of your religious activity. It's because God loves you. Yes. 
He sent his only begotten son. He loves you. So days, festivals, foods, that's all neutral now. You know, it's okay. There's, there's some Christians out there that want to eat uh, according to the kosher food laws. Barry and I have got a couple of friends that do. They follow it pretty strictly. But I like what my wife did one day. Uh, she, she, she turned to the lady and she said, do you think God loves you more than me because you don't eat pork? <laughs> and and uh, of course, the young lady said, no, I don't think that. But you know, it's, it's okay if you want to eat, keep kosher food laws, but don't let it ever creep into your mind because you're doing that that God loves you more than he does other Christian people, you see? Paul says these things were a shadow of things to come. A Greek, the Greek language, the Koine Greek that this text was written in, that word shadow in the Greek is the word that in English we derive the word photograph. Now, of course, they didn't know anything about photographs in the first century, but it's interesting the image that Paul is painting for us here of a shadow of things to come fits exactly the truth of what Paul's trying to say. A photograph is a, an image, a representation of a reality, but it's not the reality. It's a shadow. There's a story from World War II of a young man that was uh, engaged to be married. He got his orders to be shipped out of the Navy to the Pacific Ocean, and they uh, rushed out and they got married, this young couple. They loved each other tremendously, got married, and, and he, sure enough, he walked up the gangplank and was shipped out, and uh, he was gone two and a half years the war in the Pacific. And this young lady had a eight and a half by 11 photograph of that young sailor and it was framed. And suddenly she showed up everywhere she went with one of the largest purses known in 1940. She had a great big old purse. And she was quick to open that purse, pull out that framed photograph of her loved one, and show people the photograph of that sailor. And she did it for two and a half years. Well, finally the day came, he arrived back in Seattle. And as his ship docked, she was there. Gangplank was lowered, and he came down it. And she had no big purse, and she had no photograph, she had no frame. She had received the substance back into her life. Yeah. You understand? Well, what we're doing with Christ is similar to that when in our minds we adopt religious behaviors like foods or clothing or holidays that we think because we keep them or use them, it makes Christ love us more. And accept us more. Now I've got three kids. And when they were little, I enjoyed playing with them, coming home from work and spending time with them, being with them. And it would have upset me greatly if every day when I came home from work, my three kids lined up and started performing some ritual in front of me yeah. to, to let me know that they wanted me to love them. What do you think it's like for Christ when we legalistically behave ourselves in such a way that we're like performing for him, doing a dance for him? Uh, don't you think that's, uh, that's slighting the love of God, the love of Christ for us? I'm, I'm sorry that it happens, but it does. To love him. Loving these things, Paul says, it's a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. He's the reality. 
Now he says, verse 18, talk about these people that want to judge, you know, uh, your religion, <laughs> your relationship with Christ. He says, don't let anyone disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by their sensuous mind. Now, I just, I just felt somebody do it again. Somebody just tuned me out. Because they're not being tempted to worship angels. Well, if you did that, come back to me and pay attention because what Paul is teaching here is mysticism. And although you might not have Gnostic people teaching you to love angels and worship them, our generation is full of mysticism. The New Age movement, astrology, horoscopes, occultism is rampant in our culture. Eastern religions. Don't let anybody disqualify you about asceticism and worship of angels. Now, asceticism is a word Perhaps you know what that means, perhaps you don't. Asceticism, if I could be blunt, it means to punish my body in such a way that, that God loves me more. You probably heard stories in the Middle Ages of uh, Catholic monks and priests who would whip themselves and punish themselves. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes. I lived in Mexico City for a year. And I watched at the Cathedral of Guadalupe, the big cathedral for the Virgin Mary. Huge, huge church. Must have been a hundred steps to lead up to the front of it. And, and when, when I got there, all these, all these poor people, they were poor people, were on their knees, struggling up those steps on their knees, and their knees were bleeding, and their hands were bleeding. They were punishing themselves so that God would love them more. Well, Paul is talking about that very thing. Don't ever think that your self-inflicted punishments upon yourself or your worship, worshiping of other angels or spiritual beings or the New Age movement, don't think that anything about that it's going to get you closer to God. It's not going to help you walk with Christ. Notice, notice he talks about how these people would like to go on with you about visions and that they're puffed up people. They're people that are puffed up because their minds think that their behavior can make God love them more. You know, angel worship, I, I've never seen an angel. Maybe some of you have. It must be tempting when you see one to worship them. And the reason I say that is because the Apostle John, uh, a follower, a disciple of Christ, intimately in knowledge of the teaching of Christ, even John, in Revelation 19, when confronted with an angel, says that he... He fell down at his feet to worship him. And the angel said to John, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So, they must be formidable creatures, these angels. That oft times we in the, in the scriptures we have people when they see them they try to worship them. That's not to be done. Paul's counting it here too. He's saying that these Gnostics that were teaching people to to listen to angels and to seek their wisdom, he's saying that they weren't doing it out of humility; they were doing it out of pride. They were trying to say that the normal Christian in the church at Colossae were special. We receive visions 
of angels. We know things that you don't. Therefore, we're closer to God. Or you had the ascetics, people that said, look at these marks on my arms and on my back where I've whipped myself. I'm closer to God than you are. And what Paul is teaching us is that Christian people that know the Lord Jesus Christ, and when I say know, I mean know him, to experience him personally, to have a relationship with him that changes their life, they are complete. That's all that God requires. That's all he's expecting of people. It's not angels. I'd like to read for you a little bit. If you've got your Bibles, turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. And starting at verse 4, this is an extended little passage I want to read to you. But it's so pertinent to what Paul's saying, I feel like I need to. Hebrews 1, 4 following. And it's talking about Jesus here. It says, Jesus has become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Now notice angels through this. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you're my son, today I've begotten you. And again, I'll be a father to him, and he'll be a son to me. And when he brought the firstborn into the world, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Well, I could go on, and you might want to read that further later, but <clears throat> the point is this angels are subordinate beings to the Lord Jesus Christ. When he triumphed over principalities and powers, what Paul's talking about there quite simply is angels. Some fallen, some good. And Christ created the angels. They, they worship him. They answer to him. And for these Gnostic Christians in Colossae saying, uh, gosh, well, we've received these secret visions of angels and we're better than you are? No, it's just completely disavowed by the scriptures. It's not a part of the scriptures. Now, some of you might carry the King James. I want to point out to you, King James says in this verse 18, he says, intruding into those things which he has not seen. Do you see that? You notice the translation I read to you? did not say that, it's because it's correct. King James made a mistranslation at this point. What Paul is teaching us here is that spirituality is knowing him. That spirituality is not seeking visions from angels or beating your body with a whip. Asceticism. That's not it. That's not it. And deeper than that is this, this truth that don't ever allow yourself to think that you need to perform in such a way that it'll make God love you more, that it'll change God's mind about you. I think that's going to be one of the most wonderful things we experience when we get to heaven. When we see him with our eyes. Yeah. Is we're going to understand fully his love for us. We're going to understand the acceptance. We will be known when we get to heaven and we will know him in a way that down here it's just, sometimes it's just hard for us not to feel like we've got to dance to, to perform for him. Change his mind about us. And that's what Paul's trying to help us with here. Now I want to I want to spend a minute or two talking about this, this verse 18 here. This thing about angels and asceticism. 
because I feel like what falls into line with the, this verse that's common today that we will see around us today is the worship of saints and Mary in the Catholic Church. Catholic Church has over 10,000 recognized saints. That church I went to in Mexico City, those people weren't going there to see Jesus. They were going there to worship Mary. And uh, there's some things wrong with that. Uh, I think it falls right in line with what Paul's teaching us here. Uh, number one, worshiping saints. Yeah. You know, we've had some saints here at Travis, haven't we? I mean, can you imagine if, if Pastor Drew asked you to come forward and kneel down and worship one of our saints from Travis that's passed on? Yet our Catholic Church does that. Number one, it violates the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Yeah. Number two, praying to saints is praying to dead people. That is necromancy in the scriptures. God forbids it. Number three, there is only one mediator between God and man. And that mediator is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not Mary, and it's not 10,000 saints. And number four, the Bible nowhere commands Christians to honor, to intercede with, or to keep relics of dead people. It's just not there. This, these are human traditions that have come into the Catholic Church. Well, he goes on in verse 19. He says, these people, right? These people that are worshiping angels, these people that are beating themselves and sex. He says, they're not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. Do y'all remember in high school, did y'all ever have to diagram sentences? I hated that. I mean, it fascinated me to see the words with all these lines and everything, everything seemed to fall into order. But every time I did it, the teacher said it was wrong. You know, I never did learn that correctly. Well, this is a sentence that bears diagramming because Paul is talking, he's summing up everything we've talked about this morning here. And what he's saying is these people that are not holding fast to the head, and I wanted to stop right there and say, everything we've talked about this morning, these, these people that are legalists, that keep rituals, that dance and perform for God, these people that dress a certain way, these people that eat a certain way, the ones that worship angels, the ones that are in the New Age movement, uh, the ones that hurt themselves physically with whips and chains. He said, 19, these are not holding fast to the head. He's talking about Jesus there. I mean, Paul's just, he's not, he's blunt, he's clear. All of that activity that I just listed there is being done for themselves. It's not being done because they're more spiritual. It's not because they're, they're loved by Jesus more than, than you are. Paul uses the image of the body here in this verse 19. He says the body, and that's our church, all of our church, we're all fed, we're all nurtured, and we're knit together. That means how close are we as, as people, as Christians to one another? Do we really have fellowship with each other? He's saying these other people that I've listened, they're not. They're antithetical to fellowship with the church. He says the body is nourished and knit together through what? Through you, the, the, each joint in each ligament, that's, that's individual Christians in the body. That when we're holding fast to Christ and not rituals and spiritualism and things like that, 
when we're together and each one of us are walking into Sunday school each week, walking into worship each week, having had an experience of relating to Jesus Christ through the week, he says when that happens, the church grows, and it's a growth that comes from God. Verse 19 says church growth happens when people love Jesus. Yeah. You know, we say on Easter Sunday that he's alive. Well, he is alive. And what it means when we say he's alive is that we can have a personal relationship with him, that we can know him, and he can know us, that we can talk about him as someone that we are related to, that we are aware of, we're, we're able to describe what he's like, what he loves, what delights him, what does he want from us, what does he expect from me? That's what Jesus is, is risen means. And verse 19, that's what Paul's talking about, about church growth. Paul says to these people in 19, they're not holding fast to the head. Galatians 1, 8 and 9. But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, that if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you have received, let him be accursed. I think the most, most frightening thing I can imagine, especially if this takes place in a Christian church, is to pick up another gospel than what has been preached to us. We have received the gospel from the apostles, have we not? Yeah. We, we, we have this written revelation that's been given to us and we hold it in our hands and we can, we can read literally the, the words of God, his instructions to us. And so the great danger that Paul is addressing here in these verses this morning is this, that even, even if all that I just said is true, it's still possible for a false teacher to come into your church and preach another gospel. It happens in churches. He's not talking about out of the world. He's talking about church growth here. And the way that it happens is by us protecting the apostles' doctrine and teaching, the purity of the scriptures, and holding fast to the head. I'd like to close with, with just a, a summary of these three verses with, for you this morning. And that is something you can filter and think about if you want to the rest of this week. And you can apply it to your own life. Because each one of us is going to be a little different. But knowing Christ, when all is said and done, is the most important thing that can ever be said to a Christian man or woman. You know, we're all going to have different gifts. We're all going to have different talents, different positions, different vocations. But every single one of us, when we come to this church and fellowship with one another, can share personal knowledge of what the Lord Jesus has done in our lives, what he's teaching us and what he's helping us with, what he's leading us to do. When we sing in that big building over there, when we, when we pray over there, even when we listen to the sermon over there, 
That worship service is going to grow spiritually and numerically, according to Paul here, when we hold fast to the head. When the reason for our being here is to know more about Jesus Christ, to be taught about him, and to know his word better, and then to go out and serve him. And that's all Paul's saying. You're wasting your time if you think you can pick up some legalistic routine that's going to change God's mind about you. You're wasting your time if you think that seeking spiritual visions from angels or uh, mystical people is going to help. It's not. It's not going to help. Christ is everything that you need every day Amen. in every way. Amen. Well, let's stop here. We'll pick up next week and finish, uh, I guess, in verse 20 of chapter 2. Next week we'll finish chapter 2. So if you'd like to direct your study ahead a little bit, uh, we'll do those last five or six verses of chapter 2 next week. Father, I pray this morning to thank you that we can be in your house in a free country, that we can be in a place that we can openly talk about the Lord without threat or persecution. We pray and ask this morning, Father, that you would uh, take us up into your, your, your spirit. We ask, God, that these verses from the Apostle Paul, God, that you take them and apply to our heart. We ask that uh, although we might not have Jewish people or angels or mystics, uh, in the way that Paul described on the I, I do know for a fact, Lord, because it's in me, that we tend to want to act out for you and not accept the, the awesome, wonderful love that you have for us. Father, we love you. We pray that you'll forgive us for what we've done wrong, and we pray that you'll be with us this week as we uh, seek to know you, know the Lord Jesus, for we pray in his name. Amen. Amen.